Let's get to the Bible. If you brought one with you, please open it to John 17. We are making our way through a series called Life in His Name, and we are studying every word of the Gospel of John. And our eager expectation and hope as we study is that we will realize in our midst and in our lives the very reason that John said he wrote the Gospel, which is this. He said, I have written these things to you so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. John did not pretend to write without an agenda. He wrote with a very clear agenda. And he said, I'm writing to convince you that Jesus is God because I'm convinced that if you believe that, you will have life in his name. That's our hope as we study is that we will believe that Jesus is God and experience the eternal life that only he can offer. This morning, we get to a very precious and special place in God's word. We get to John 17. We're going to study the first five verses in a message I'm calling the priority prayer. Well, there's nothing like a deadline to reveal your priorities. When the time approaches what you care about becomes crystal clear. I found this out recently uh, because I learned uh, that when you go to the airport and you see the two lines before security, the one that says TSA pre-check and the one that says for the other peasants, um, those lines are not delineated by your travel frequency. Now, I always thought that it was like if you get gold status with American or you fly a million miles or you do X, Y, Z, then you would have the status of airline royalty bestowed upon you and you could go in the quick line. I figured out that's not how it works. All it takes is an appointment at a government office, 80 bucks, and you get five years of royal treatment, five years of instantaneous security lines. You can just buy it. So I was like, this sounds good. I think I'm going to fly a couple of times in the next few months. So I'm going to make an appointment at this office. And then my life got very busy. (laughs) I've got two little kids and another one on the way, a busy church, lots of things to do. And the appointment is down at the airport. And you got to like find a parking space, pay for it, go into the thing, talk to some person, show them your passport, pay them the money, all this stuff. And so when the morning of the appointment came, it became very clear that I didn't care that much about TSA PreCheck. Because I just blew off the appointment. I was like, I've got way more important things to do. I will wait in the line for 30 minutes. No problem. I just blew off the appointment. But there's another kind of deadline that comes to me every single week that I care very much about, and it is a sermon prep deadline. Now, I do not blow that one off. (laughs) I don't skip that appointment. I I don't refuse to spend time on it. Sometimes I even forget that there's other human beings in the world while I'm preparing sermons. Sometimes I am so laser focused on the deadline of a sermon that I forget that I have to like eat food and raise children and do really important things because I'm so focused and I care so much about this deadline. At the very end of Jesus's life, as the final hours of his earthly life are upon him, we're going to see in John 17 an utterly unique section of scripture because we have here the only extended record of something that Jesus prayed. Many other places in scripture, we are told that Jesus prayed, but we are not told exactly what he prayed. That only exists in your Bible right here in John 17. And not only is this uh, an extended recorded prayer of Jesus, it is a prayer that he prayed mindful of the fact that he was hours away from his death. And when the deadline is upon you, in your final words, in your final prayer, what you care about becomes very clear and very obvious. And so we have this unique privilege as we study John 17 to peek behind the curtain of the relationship between the eternal Son and the eternal Father the relationship that exists within God himself, as in the presence of his apostles, Jesus calls out to his father in the final hours of his life. We're gonna see with crystal clarity what Jesus cares about most. And if today you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you must care about what Jesus cares about. In fact, I would argue that that's fundamental to what it means to be a Christian, that you die to yourself and your life is no longer about your priorities, but about his. You care about what he cares about 
That's the big idea today. True disciples share the consuming priorities of Jesus in his final hour. In Jesus' final hour, his all-consuming priorities are going to rise right to the surface. And they will be as plain as day for us to see as he prays to his father right before his betrayal and arrest. And this morning, we are going to get to observe those priorities and see whether or not our priorities are shared. Do we care about what Jesus cares about? Do we prioritize what Jesus prioritizes? Because this week passed, and even today, as you sit in this room, you operate on a list of priorities. You have a hierarchy of things that you care about. You spend time on it. You spend mental energy. You spend emotions on it. You spend money on it. You think about it. You pursue it. You, you love it. Whatever it is on your priority list, if you are a follower of Jesus today, you're going to get to see Jesus' priorities and hold them up against your priorities and ask if there is overlap. Do I care about what Jesus cares about? Because if I'm a true disciple, then I will share the consuming priorities of Jesus that we see in a unique way in this final hour of his life. Let's read together John 17. Let's see these priorities as Jesus prays. And let's not forget that as we read, we are reading the very words of God. John 17, 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. True disciples share the consuming priorities of Jesus in his final hour. We would do well to ask the question, what are his consuming priorities? What does he care about? And if I'm a follower of Jesus, if I'm a true disciple, then what should I care about? And that's what we're going to see. We're going to see five consuming priorities from these five verses as Jesus begins this prayer this place in the scriptures that has been called the high priestly prayer because Jesus is going to mediate for us in the prayer, this place in the scriptures that has been called the holy of holies as we see this unique glimpse into the relationship of the father and the son. We're going to see these five priorities and we'll unpack them like this. If I share his priorities, here's number one, I long for his glory. I long for his glory. Verse 1 says, when Jesus had spoken these words. Now, this refers immediately to the preceding chapters that have led us to this point. If you remember, inside of the context of the structure of the Gospel of John, chapter 1 of John, we had this incredible introduction about the Word who was with God and who was God, and that Word became flesh. And then all the way through the rest of chapter 1 to chapter 11, we have Jesus teaching and healing and performing miracles and showing everyone his divine power and nature. And then at chapter 12 into chapter 13, there's a dramatic shift and the time slows down and we got this one meal and this extended conversation that we call the upper room discourse from chapter 13 all the way through to the end in chapter, uh, the end of chapter 16, which we studied two weeks ago. And now Jesus is going to turn the corner here. Having said all of these words, having spoken all of these things, he now is going to turn to prayer. And you'll remember, chances are that they have since left the upper room and they are on their way to the garden where Jesus will pray before the moment of his arrest. Somewhere along that journey, Jesus stops to pray in the presence of his, his 11 faithful men, his 11 apostles. And it says here, he lifted his eyes to heaven. Jesus assumes what for him was a posture of prayer and he looks up to heaven and he begins to pray and he says, Father, he prays relationally. In this way, as he did when he gave us the Lord's Prayer, what might better be called the Disciples' Prayer, teaching the disciples to pray, he prayed to his Father. So he prays relationally. 
And he prays this. He begins by saying, the hour has come. The hour has come. If you've been attentive all through John, Jesus has been deferring this hour consistently to a later date. He said, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. And then in this culminating conversation in the upper room discourse, and now in this prayer, he says, it's here. The time has arrived. I've been saying it wasn't yet, but now it's here. The hour has come. And we've talked about this multiple times, but the hour for Jesus is the climactic cluster of events that accompany the very end of his life and display most fully the very reason he came to earth in the first place. This is his betrayal and his arrest, his condemnation, his his torture, his death by crucifixion, and then his burial in a tomb, his resurrection from the dead, and his ascension into heaven. If you grouped all of that together, that's what Jesus means when he says, it's my hour. The time is here. Now, If we understand what constitutes his hour, which will include his bloody and brutal death upon a Roman torture tool, what he says next is a little bit puzzling. Because he says, my hour has come. And because we're students of the Bible, we're like, okay, I know that means the cross. And what he says next is this, glorify your son. Glorify me. Now, I can think of a lot of words to describe the torture and death that would ensue for Jesus, but I don't know about you, glory is not one of the first that comes to mind. It's not instantly the first thing I think. So why in the world does Jesus tie together his inevitable death and glory? This last week, I finished a book called Unbroken, You may know it for a a movie that was produced in 2014. It is the story of a man named Louis Zamperini, who was an Olympic distance runner turned World War II POW. He was a bombardier, and his plane crashed in the middle of the ocean. He drifted thousands of miles. He was picked up by the Japanese and put into a camp where he suffered unspeakable brutality and malevolence for years on end. And if you read if you read the book, the the center section of the book, like the main body of the text, is just a chronicle of the misery and suffering and pain that he experienced. But Louis Zamberini's story is an amazing story. I might even say it is a glorious story because the time of his pain came to an end and miraculously he survived all the torture that he endured. He not only made it out of Japan, uh, but after Japan and after the war, he descended into a life of chaos and alcoholism and abuse and PTSD, horrible flashbacks. And one day at a Billy Graham crusade, the guy gave his life to Jesus and he never had another flashback again for the, the remaining five decades of his life. And he served Jesus until the day he died. It's an, it's an amazing, amazing story because it is a story of redemption. The reason his story is remarkable is because he didn't live an uninterrupted existence of comfort and ease, but he went through the crucible of suffering and came out the other side with redemption. That's what makes his story so remarkable, more than worthy to be turned into a movie. And this is part of what Jesus is saying here. You you will notice that Jesus is not going to have the time of his glory be the cheering and approval of the crowds and they put a crown of gold on his head and he'll be lifted up on a throne to be adored by the masses. The time of his glory will be the exact opposite. They will mock him and jeer at him. They will put a crown of thorns on his head and they will lift him up on a cross. And he says, this is the hour of my greatest glory. Why? Because it is that great suffering and pain that was the ultimate expression of the love of God to redeem a broken people and win glory for his name. That's what the hour of Jesus would accomplish. It would accomplish the eternal redemptive plan of God to save people from their sin and adopt them into his family and secure them and forgive them and love them forever. And Jesus knows it. And so he says the hour is here. And yes, that hour will require suffering and death. But that hour is the hour of my glory. 
So here's what I wonder. When you hear Jesus pray this and you hear him pray, glorify your son at this climactic hour of my life, has it been the pattern of your life to look to the cross and the empty tomb of the Lord Jesus and to see the glory of God there? To see the majesty and the beauty and the love of God displayed in unparalleled ways as the son of God becomes the lamb of God and suffers on the cross unto death so that you could be rescued. Do you see there the glory of God? And just like Jesus, do you long for him to receive glory for what he has accomplished? Is that the desire of your life? Or if you were praying, would you pray, I think I deserve the glory. I think I should get some shine for what I've done. Or do you fall in the presence of your holy God and say Jesus and Jesus alone deserves glory? Jesus' priority in this prayer is his glory. Now, lest you accuse him of narcissism, look at what he says. He says, glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Jesus wanted glory so that he could turn it back to his father in heaven. I mean, what could be less narcissistic than going to the cross to suffer for sinners so that you can glorify your father in heaven and bless people who are desperately in need for all time and eternity to the ends of the earth? That's what Jesus wants glory for, is giving his life to rescue people who could never rescue themselves. And if you look at that great work and you long for his glory to be known in your life and beyond, then you share his priority. It is the hour of his greatest glory. And every true disciple shares these consuming priorities of Jesus in his final hour. That is only the first priority, and we have four more. Let's move. If I share his priorities, number two, I submit to his authority. Number two, Jesus here gives us the reason. He gives us his grounds for making such a request to God. Like, why in the world would he say, glorify me? Well, he tells us here in verse two, and he says this, since you have given him authority over all flesh. Authority is the rightful ability to exercise dominion or control. The rightful ability to do it. That's what authority is. So if you're the boss, you have authority over the company. If you are the dad, despite the protestations of your toddlers, you you have authority over the family. If you're the king, you have authority over the country. That's what authority is. And Jesus here is saying that the reason that God should glorify him is because he gave him authority, get this, over all humanity. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, God, my father, you have given me authority over all flesh. Now, if we're paying attention, this is an unequivocal description of divinity. Because pause for a moment and think about who else in the world you could say this about. I have authority over every living creature. That's God stuff. God and God alone. And Jesus says that prerogative and that power and that authority belongs to him because it was given to him by the Father He has authority over all of humanity. Now, he has this authority for a purpose, and he tells us what that purpose is here. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life. That's amazing. The reason Jesus has authority, or at least one of the reasons, is so that he can bestow the gift of eternal life. But who does he give it to? He tells us here, to all whom you have given me. To all whom you have given me, who is the target? Who is the recipient of this great gift of eternal life? Well, here in the Gospel of John and plenty of other places, namely chapter 6, and then as we keep reading through chapter 17, this designation will occur at least three more times. Jesus is going to refer to a group of people who have been given to him by the Father and to whom he gives the gift of eternal life. So there is a group of people, it's referred to in multiple places in the scriptures, repeatedly in the gospel of John. There is a group of people who the father gave to the son and to whom the son gave eternal life. I read one commentator say it this way this week. He said, we often think of Christ as God's gift to us, 
but we very rarely think of us as God's gift to Christ. But that's what the scriptures reveal, that the Father gave a group of people to the Son to be his bride for all of eternity, and the Son has given his life to give salvation and redemption to that group of people. Now, maybe at this point in the sermon, you stop and say, yeah, preacher, I would like to know who belongs in that group of people. So would I, (laughs) but we don't. We do not have a roster of who is in that group of people that the father has given to the son. All we have is evidence of who belongs in that group. So if you go back to chapter six of of John's gospel in verse 37, you will see a phrase that says this. Jesus says, all that the father has given to me. So if you wanna know who's in this group that the father has given to the son, he says, all of the people that God has given me will do one thing. He says, all that the father has given me will come to me. This is in the context of Jesus feeding the thousands of people and then calling himself the bread of life. And he is saying, anyone who comes to me to be satisfied, anyone who comes to me to receive the bread of life that only I can offer, they demonstrate, they evidence the fact that in eternity past, God the Father gave them to me and I gave them eternal life. This is a miracle of God's saving grace because the emphasis all the way through this, despite how much we would really like to contribute, despite how much we would really like to be in charge, despite how much we would really like to have authority, you will notice here that all of the giving and all of the authority, all of it belongs to God and not to us. God is the one who gives. God is the one who supplies. God is the one who provides. God is the one who bestows the gift of eternal life to whomever he wills. And Christians True disciples are those who see that undeniable authority of God and joyfully submit themselves to it. Christians are the ones who say, God, you are God and I am not. I submit myself to your authority. You are the one who gives eternal life. You are the one who has rightful authority over every created thing. And so you certainly have authority over my life. That's what Christians, that's how Christians live is they share this consuming priority of the authority of Jesus. They joyfully and gladly submit themselves underneath of it. Is that true for your life? Jesus says, I have authority over all flesh. Does he have authority over how you spend your time? Does he have authority over how you use your phone? Does he have authority over how you spend your money? how you conduct your relationships, the words that you say, the dreams that you have, the plans that you make? Does he have authority over your life? Because if you share his consuming priorities, you will joyfully submit to his authority. Here's the third priority. If I share his priorities, number three, I live with his knowledge. I live with his knowledge. Now, just in case in the last point, Jesus said, I give eternal life to all those whom you have given me. And you felt confused about what eternal life is. You're not sure how to define that. Jesus is like, well, I'm so glad you asked. Here's a very simple definition of eternal life. It's very helpful that Jesus does this because eternal life is a sort of Christianese phrase that we can throw around because we've heard a lot of other people say it. We've read it in the Bible and then we say it and we assume the person we're talking to has the same definition that we do. And chances are they're not even remotely close. We've probably populated this definition with all kinds of different ideas, but Jesus here gives us a very simple, very accessible definition of what eternal life is. For all of those non-theologians, all of those unfamiliar with God's word, not very well versed in the things of Christianity, Jesus just puts the cookies right on the bottom shelf. He makes it as easy as possible for you to understand what eternal life is, and he says it this way, this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So if you ever wonder what eternal life is, this is it. It is to know God, to know God. Jesus tells us a couple very important things here. He tells us that there is only one true God. There are not multiple gods. You don't get a God buffet and decide which ones you like and don't like and you get to pick one and they're all really God. If you just peek behind the veil, they're all the same thing. Jesus says, there is one God. 
There is one true and living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is one God. And he says eternal life is to know that God. But he doesn't stop there. He says, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, I want to pause here for a moment because there are some statements in the Bible. You may have heard, like, uh, you may have heard somebody say, the Bible doesn't say the word Trinity. That's true. But there are some places in the Bible that make no sense unless you have a triune understanding of God, and I would contend that this is one of those places. Because think about this sentence. Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ. He's actually saying that there are two components of knowledge that are required for this eternal life, knowing God and knowing Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Now, just as a thought experiment, I want you to imagine for a moment replacing Jesus Christ with anything or anyone else and just like try that on for size. See how it fits in this sentence. This is eternal life that they know you, the one true and living God, and Carl. You'd be like, Carl, what are you talking about? In the sentence, it's grammatically clear that whoever is on the other side of that and is being elevated to the place of God himself. Undeniably clear that if you're going to have eternal life, you have to know God and you have to know Jesus Christ. And why is that? Because he is the God of eternity in a human body. You can't get around it. You can't read your Bible and come to any other conclusion other than the fact that Jesus is God himself in human flesh. And so it is here. He says that to have eternal life, you need to know God. And the way you know God is you know me. So if you have any conception that you can have eternal life, that you can know God, but your life pays no reference towards Jesus Christ. You don't submit to Jesus Christ. You don't follow Jesus Christ. According to this verse, it's John 17, verse three, you do not have eternal life. Eternal life is to know God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent both. Now, the biblical concept of knowing goes well beyond just knowing facts. The biblical concept of knowing is knowing deeply and knowing relationally and knowing experientially. It's knowing like you would know a friend. It's knowing like you would know a spouse. It is relating to them. So I don't know when you hear the phrase eternal life, what you think of. Maybe when you hear the phrase eternal life, you think of some future date when you will go to heaven and you will float in some disembodied way and while uh, you know babies in diapers play harps, you will worship Jesus and you're not really sure what that's going to be like, but that sounds like what eternal life is. It sounds ethereal and abstract. Jesus obliterates that concept. He says eternal life is to know God. And if you just, if you just kind of for a moment just remove that from the realm of the abstract, think about what it means to know someone. When you know someone, you spend time with them. You talk to them. You learn to love them. You grow in your affection for them. You begin to care about what they care about. You develop develop your understanding of who they are and what they prioritize. That's what it means to know someone. And Jesus is saying that eternal life is to do that with God. To spend time with him. To love him. To know him to speak to him, to listen to him. That is eternal life, to be connected to God in relationship, to deeply and experientially walk with him. That is eternal life. And here's the great blessing of what that teaches us. You, if in fact you are united to Christ through repentance and faith, you have eternal life right now. You do not need to wait for some future date where you will enjoy the gift of eternal life you can know God right now. God is not hiding from you. He's not far away from you. He's not blocked off his calendar so you can't make an appointment with him. He's not inaccessible. You can know God right now. And if you are gonna share Jesus's priorities as he prays, then you will understand that you live as you know God. You live with the knowledge of God. So loved ones, 
live in your eternal life right now. Enjoy eternal life by knowing God and anticipate the day. Because maybe, maybe you're in this room and you're like, well, that sounds great, but my life stinks. My life is hard. My life is full of suffering. This doesn't feel like eternal life to me. And you're right, it is hard. And eternal life right now, knowing God, is filled with all kinds of obstacles. Namely, and foremost, our own indwelling sin nature that keeps us from wanting to know God. We've got all kinds of challenges and all kinds of obstacles. But the great blessing is that by the power of the Spirit, we can fight to know God and we can live in the experience of eternal life right now while we anticipate the day that every obstacle will be removed and I will see God face to face and I will know him as he is and enjoy him forever. That is the great hope of your Christian life is that you are living in eternal life right now and you know that that eternal life will be consummated when you stand before him. If I share his priorities, I live. My eternal life is built with his knowledge. Here's number four. If I share his priorities, I rest in his accomplishment. Jesus says, I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. So good. Jesus says to his father, he's already prayed, hey, he's prayed, Father, glorify me so that I can glorify you. But Jesus is not asking for something new to be done. He's asking for a continuation of what has already been purchased by his obedient life. He says, God, I have glorified you. I'm doing it. Jesus already has glorified the Father by accomplishing his will, by executing his plans. He's been saying this all through the Gospel of John. I do not act on my own accord. I say what the Father gave me to say. I came on the Father's mission. This is why I'm here. This is what I'm doing. So as Jesus was teaching and healing and discipling, he was doing it all to glorify the Father. But then he says this amazing thing. He says, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Now, Jesus is praying on the far side of the cross. He has not yet gone and given his life yet. That's like the most important part of his work. But what I love about this is that Jesus is praying as if it is done. He is praying as if the cross and the empty tomb has already been accomplished. And I think in part that's because when Jesus decided to go to the cross, it was as good as done and nothing would stop him from going there. And we've seen that even in the gospel of John, his laser focus on heading towards his hour and he will not be deterred. And the hordes of hell and the forces of darkness and his weak disciples, no one and nothing can stop him from doing what he came to do. It is as good as done. And so he says, Father, I've glorified you and I've accomplished everything you gave me to do. The beauty of this is that you and I, we get to benefit from what Jesus has accomplished. And there are so many aspects of our lives where we benefit from the work that other people did. You know what I'm talking about? I think part of living a grateful life is just remembering all of the ways that you are tremendously blessed because of what people that you have never met did for you. Here's a simple example. You live in a house. Chances are you didn't build that house. If you did build your house, come talk to me. I would like to have a relationship with you. Maybe you can build me a house. I didn't build my house. If in fact you have the joy and the pleasure of living in a house, chances are someone else built it and you just enjoy their work. If you drive a car, someone else designed it, someone else engineered it, someone else manufactured it, you just live in it. For me, I praise God every day that by common grace, someone had the human ingenuity to invent contact lenses. I was talking to Pastor Kirk this week and he was like, he came into the office and he was kind of like down a little bit. And I was like, what's wrong, Pastor Kirk? And he's like, I just went to the optometrist and my prescription went from 0.5 to 2. And I was like, boo-hoo, I'm a negative 7. Deal with it. You're like, it's a little fuzzy. I'm like, I'm going to kill someone if I operate a motor vehicle. I am, I am blind as a bat without contact lenses. And I praise God every day. I can see something because some genius did the work of inventing contact lenses. And I just benefit from it. The ultimate expression of I didn't do the work, but I benefit from it is our salvation. 
that Jesus Christ has accomplished all that the Father gave him to do, and we gain the gift of forgiveness and eternal life. Now, here's where this is a problem, because we live in the spirit of the American dream. And if we just work hard enough and pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, and if we're just creative and intelligent, and if we just hustle, then we can get all of the things that we want to get. And the understanding that you must have of salvation just obliterates that mindset. It says you cannot actually gain the gift of salvation unless you first admit that there was nothing you could do to earn it. There's no possible way that you could be good enough or obedient enough or moral enough to make yourself worthy of what Jesus Christ has done for you. That's what makes it such good news. You and I were hopeless on our own, but Jesus Christ did everything that was necessary for us to be rescued. This is the good news of the gospel, that his righteous life gets swapped out from my life of disobedience. And the penalty that I earned for my disobedience gets placed upon him at his cross. And then after he dies to pay for my sin, the power of his resurrection is given to me in the gift of eternal life. His work, my benefit. I was reminded this week of a song that we sing periodically around here. A friend reminded me of these lyrics. It's, the song's called, How Deep the Father's Love. And the words go like this. Why should I gain from his reward? That's a great question. Why in the world should we benefit because of what Christ did? Why should I gain from his reward? The writer of the hymn just says, I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. If you are a follower of Jesus today, your great eternal hope is not that you can accomplish anything to make yourself right with God. It is that he has done it all and you can rest in him. Your great hope is laying yourself bare before God and saying, God, I have nothing to offer you. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, but I receive the blessing of your love and forgiveness through the finished work of your great son, Jesus. This is what Jesus prays. He says, I have glorified you and I've accomplished everything you gave me to do. I'll just tell you, the most passionate worship does not come from the person who is convinced that they contributed something to their salvation. The most grateful heart and the most burning affection, the most white hot worship, it comes from somebody who knows that they had nothing they could do and Jesus did it all. So if you wonder today why your worship is lackluster, maybe you should evaluate how much you think you've done to make God owe you to make God look at you. If you think this is a meritocracy and you do this, you do X and God gives you Y, you've got the gospel all discombobulated. You need to remember that there was nothing you could do. Jesus accomplished all of the work and you will run to him in passionate, grateful adoration and worship and your life will change. These are his priorities. If I share his priorities, I rest in his accomplishment. There's one more. If I share his priorities, I marvel at his eternality. I marvel. Verse five is one of those places in God's word that you get to. And it's like, it's just mind boggling. It feels unfair that we even get to know this stuff. It is so good. Verse five says, and now father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. We get this mind blowing uh, peek behind the curtain into the eternal intertrinitarian relationship between the Father and the Son. And here's what Jesus says. Jesus has been talking all the way through John 14 to 16. He's saying, I'm going back to the Father and I'm going to be in his presence where I will prepare a place for you. And here he says, Father, when I get to your presence, glorify me. We kinda, we're tracking with that so far, but then he explains in the second half of the sentence, that the glory to which he will go will not be a new experience for him. It will be something that he has already enjoyed for all of eternity past. 
So this will not be Jesus gaining glory for the first time. This will be Jesus returning to the glory that is eternally and rightfully his. Because he is the word who was in the beginning with God and who was God. And so he shares eternal glory with God, the Father and the Son and the Spirit, all living together in perfect harmony and relationship for all time and eternity past. And Jesus says, the time is approaching when I will get that back. Not I will get it for the first time. I will enjoy the glory that I have already had for eternity. And if you needed another nail to pound in your case that Jesus is God, the Bible is resplendent with this notion that God will not share his glory with anyone except himself. Isaiah 48, 11 says, my glory, I will not give to another. And Jesus says, hey, father, that glory that's yours, it's mine too. It's mine too. And when I get to your presence, Give me the glory back that I enjoyed with you for all time and eternity. (laughs) Now, sometimes I think that the appropriate application of God's word is just to stop for a second and say, whoa, whoa. (laughs) Just to marvel, just to stand in awe of our great God and Savior. Have you ever done that? You ever had an experience, you ever seen something, you ever witnessed something that just made it such that words felt almost pathetic to attempt? Maybe for you, it's like seeing something in nature. For me, it was driving up the windy road and cresting the hill at Glacier National Park and just seeing the view in Montana. You just don't say anything. You just sit there with your jaw on the floor and you just say, whoa. And sometimes that is what we ought to do when we consider the eternality, the divinity, and the beauty of Jesus Christ is just marvel. So I wonder, when was the last time that you just stood in awe of Jesus? That you worshiped him and cherished him for his awe-inspiring character, for his wonder-inducing nature. You just worshiped him and marveled at who he is. If we're gonna share the priorities of Jesus, we will marvel at the fact that he is the God of eternity and he entered a human body so that he could rescue us. True disciples share the consuming priorities of Jesus in his final hour. Here's a few questions before you go. We call this learning to live because we want to learn God's word, not just to accumulate information, but to change the way that we live. Here's the first question. Who determines my priorities? Someone is determining the hierarchy of order and importance in your life. Who is it? If you were to stop in an honest moment of self-reflection, is it still you? Do you retain the spot of master and commander of your own life and you decide what is most important to you? Or have you surrendered? Have you died to yourself? Have you given all of your authority to Jesus Christ as you've submitted to him as a Lord and you have said, your priorities are now my priorities? And if you have yet to do that, do it now. Do it today. Run to Jesus and submit to him as Lord. Receive him as Savior. You can have the full and free forgiveness and transformation and eternal life that he offers if you will come to him knowing your need, repent and turn from your sin and place your confidence in him and in him alone and allow him to set your priorities. Maybe you think to yourself, well, I've already done that. I am a Christian, but sometimes my priorities are a little off. Here's number two. How is priority realignment accomplished? Every single one of us walked into this room this morning with some sort of disordered priorities. Because of our remaining sin, not a one of us has perfectly ordered priorities according to God's command. 
And so what will it look like and what will it take for us this week as we live our lives, as we go to work, as we go to school, as we raise our families, as we relate in our neighborhoods, what can it look like for us to realign and reorder our priorities so that they reflect what God cares about? Maybe even just start in John 17 with the prayer that Jesus prays and see if your heart beats with these priorities that Jesus has as he prays in his final hour. And then ask yourself, what means of grace has God supplied to me so that my life and my priorities and my affections, my habits can be rearranged? Maybe you need to spend more time in his word than you do. Maybe you need to quiet yourself and put your phone in another room and just pray Maybe you need to try praying without just ripping off a laundry list to God. You just need to speak to God and sit in the quiet and listen to God. Maybe you need to invite someone else into your life and you need to confess sin to them and they can pray for you so that you can be healed and forgiven of that sin and grow to be more like Jesus. How is my priority realignment accomplished? And then number three, who will know the son because they know me? Jesus Christ's ministry was all about displaying who he was to the world that desperately needed him. So who will know him because they know you? And how in the world will they see what Jesus cares about unless you care about it too? How can you go to love and to serve those who desperately need Christ to share boldly the truth of the gospel of who he is and what he's done so that they can see him and know him? True disciples share the consuming priorities of Jesus in his final hour. May his priorities be our priorities and may may we be living committed to his mission for his glory. Let's pray.